Good morning. Welcome and happy Sabbath. Love to see the smiling faces out there. Who wants to have a walk with Jesus this morning? Amen. Let's uh, sing the song to open up just a closer walk with thee. Just a closer walk with Thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee. I'm not that tall. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. I'd like to read Ephesians 1, uh, 3 this morning. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places because we are united with Christ. God has given us so many, many blessings beyond what we have asked for. It's so good to see everybody this morning. So I welcome each of you. I welcome those who are online. Thank you for coming. Let's ask God's blessing on our service. Loving Father, be with us today. Please fill this place with your angels. Please draw us close to you. Thank you for loving us and bringing us here this morning. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. There are all kinds of things happening around here that we need to 
to be reminded of in your pew ahead of you are these yellow or blue cards. The blue ones sort of indicate maybe you'd like to transfer. And some of you have been here with us for quite a while and are just part of us, and yet you're not a real part of us. We'd like to have you as part of us. The yellow card, if you'd like a visit from the pastor or some of us elders, fill that out, and you can either give it to one of us or the pastor or put it in the the little box out where the offering goes. And speaking of offering, it's for the local church budget. We appreciate what you've been giving. It helps us keep our church in repair, and there's things that go wrong, like the women's bathroom when it rains too much and uh, the ceiling just collapsed. We're working on getting that (laughs) fixed. But all of these things, whether it's the quarterlies that we have or the children's things or whether it's keeping the grounds in good repair, all of these things come with the offering. And now, Tess, go ahead. So this afternoon, Jubilee Lake. This is supposed to be relaxing. So for all driving like crazy maniacs to get there right after church for lunch, we will be stressed. So not to worry, go home, relax, have a snack. We're going to meet at Jubilee Lake uh, for some fun, water, hiking, and we're going to have what I call as plupper. So late lunch, early supper. So whenever you get there, it will be $3 day use fee. And my understanding of where we will meet is when you get into Jubilee Lake uh, and you get down to where the water is, if you go towards the right a little ways, there's a picnic-type area. There's some people going earlier to reserve that for us. Uh, Also, there'll be several of us probably milling around looking for people. So that's the place that we uh, will be meeting. Also, tomorrow, Sunday, for Children's Ministry, 3 o'clock at Memorial Pool, there is a wonderful uh, women's ministry event happening that afternoon as well. So for those that aren't going, especially the men, bring your children to this. There will be food provided. You don't even have to make anything. Pizza and drinks. So meet inside Memorial Pool where the yellow uh, covered area is. That's tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Happy Sabbath. Hello. So I want to just touch on what Tess said. Yes, we have a women's ministry event tomorrow at my home up at the ranch on the South Fork. Rhoda will be here at the church a little bit before 5 to be a guide, but she will be leaving here at 5 o'clock. So if you aren't sure that you know how to get up there, come to the church and Rhoda will guide you up to the South Fork. Also, if you need to carpool, ask around. There are women who are willing to carpool. The other thing is, it's on um, our message is on Lydia. So we want to encourage everyone to wear purple. And I think I got it. Look for balloons. That's the other thing. I'm going to put balloons going up to Southport. So just come and fellowship and have a wonderful time. There will be a light supper. So just come. Thank you. It sounds like so much fun. Good morning. Well, our, our current uh, Grow Group semester is drawing to an end, which means that we are looking for um, new people. I know some of the group leaders are going to be redoing uh, it again this next uh, semester. Um, but if you would like to start a group this next semester, uh, I encourage you to contact me. Uh, again, I, I want to thank so much all of the leaders that launched the new groups this last quarter. I know it's hard to get something started during the summer, but I thank you for your effort in doing that, and I know that many people were blessed by that, so thank you so much. 
Um, but yeah, just come in and contact me. Again, these groups are, are September through November, shared interests, spiritual, social, and service oriented. You can call me, text me, email, email me, or grab me after church. Now, is Carolyn around here? She had an announcement for VBS. I know she was earlier because she gave me the information I need to do the group that I'm going to do. So VBS is coming up soon, and we still could use some more help. I don't see her, so I'm going to go on to the next. We're going to have a church business meeting. August 6th. Now, since I know what it's about, we need to redo this. How many of you love this window? (laughs) Well, we have some proposals, some things that we think we can do to fix it, but we need you to come August 6th, Sabbath, um, late afternoon. We'll have uh, praise and music and prayer, and then we'll have a light supper and the business meeting. So put that in your calendar. Remember that. Then we're coming up with our church camp out at Wooten just September. That's not, I guess it's two months away, but it goes so fast. Next weekend, we will have sign-up sheets, registration, out in the lobby, and we've already been, some have said, well, I won't be here, but put me down for that. There are a few trailer spaces. There are cabins. It's going to be a great time. We're planning some real good things. So, what's the question? Okay. It's a lot of announcements. I hope you read your bulletins. And uh, go to the newsletter. Now I think it's time for our children's story. And Kyle has promised to tell the story today. So you children, while we sing a song, go around and gather money. This goes to help pay for children who want to go to school and their families don't have enough money to do it. So we want to help everybody out. Thank you, everyone. One, two, three, four, open the door. Let Jesus in. Five, six, seven, eight, who do we appreciate? It's Jesus again. 9, 10, 11, 12, when we let our minds dwell on Jesus, our friend, we can count on Jesus, one to a hundred, we're with with Him. 12, 11, 10, 9, everything will be fine, keep Jesus inside. 8, 7, 6, 5, we'll survive. If with Him we abide, four, three, two, now I ask you, has this been fun? We can count on Jesus, forward and backward, He's number one. One, two, three, four, open the door, let Jesus in. Five, six, seven, eight, who do we appreciate? It's Jesus again. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, when we let our minds dwell on Jesus, the friend, we can count on Jesus, one to a hundred, we're with it with him. Twelve, eleven, ten, nine, everything will be fine.
And it's been a while since I've heard that song. I think the last time I heard that was this size. That's an awesome song. I like that. So, boys and girls, I am going to tell you a story today. And unlike Matt Davy that always tells fish stories, I have stories that are either about animals or have something to do with a car. This time it's about a car, something to do with a car. So over Christmas break, we had some time off because, you know, that happens at Christmas. And we decided we wanted to go somewhere where the temperature was warmer than Walla Walla. So that means south. So we decided that we were going to go to Arizona. And we actually ended up going all the way down to the border. So we went way down south. But on our way down, we discovered something about Arizona that we didn't know. Well, I knew, but I don't think the kids and probably Tess didn't know. It can snow in Arizona. And I was like, wait, what? So we stopped in a town called Flagstaff for the night. And when we came out in the morning, there was snow, wet, sloppy snow over every car in the parking lot. Now, I like to think that I'm well prepared. So I had a snow scraper and window brush with me. And I brushed off our van, and because my parents were traveling with us, I was the dutiful son, and I brushed off their car. And then I looked around and saw everybody else in the parking lot had their car still covered in snow. And I decided that I would be a good neighbor. And I went and cleaned off as many cars as I could, and the people came out and they were like, do you work here? No. I'm from Washington. Oh, that makes sense. So one of the guys, he was so um, happy. He's like, here, let me pay you. You can, like, go buy a coffee or something. I was like, no, nah, don't worry about it, man. I work for Walla Walla University. <laughs> I didn't say that last part. That was for, that was for you. <laughs> I should have. I said, no, 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 it's okay. Don't worry about it. Just pass it on. He's like, yeah, man, totally. I'll do that. And so we got on our trip and kept going, you know, a few, a few miles later, we came to a place where we were going to meet some friends, and we met them, and it was pouring rain, and we talked to them for a while, and then we decided to go back out on the highway again to keep driving, because, I mean, rain in Arizona, come on, we wanted sunshine. So we started driving, and there was a huge accident up ahead, and the traffic was back up for miles and miles and miles and miles. And so we sat there, and if I was someone who wrote a book, I probably could have written a book that was 500 pages long in that wait. It was so long. I think we used up just about everything to entertain the kids that we could think of. And finally, the line got moving again. But there was a guy whose car had gotten, I don't know, the battery died for some reason, because maybe he was trying to stay warm. I don't know what the reason was, but the battery died. And so they were in the high-speed lane. There's a car parked. And so, again, I like to think I'm well-prepared, so I had a tow strap. And so we hooked up the police car that came by with the tow strap to the man, and he pulled him to the side, and we got our tow strap back, and away we went. Had our vacation, and coming back through Flagstaff again, it snowed. Again. And this time, Tess is driving, and she's driving like this. And I'm like, I'm going to need a PT to work on your shoulders afterwards. I know a few. So we, we, we were helping some people again. Like, there was a guy in the ditch. Hello, did you need some help? No, I'm fine. The police are coming. Another guy in the ditch. Hello, I'm fine. The police are coming. And eventually, we ended back up in Baker City in Oregon. We're like, good, we're almost home. And we discovered they closed the interstate. And we're like, can anything else go wrong on our trip? We're three hours-ish from home. It's cold. It's Friday evening. We want to be home for Sabbath. And some dodo decided to pull a gun out on the highway and carjack somebody, and so they closed the highway down from Pendleton to Baker City and all the side roads, except the one that goes down through John Day. <laughs> so we took that road. And long about this town called Long Creek, a light comes on in my dashboard. 
the little yellow exclamation light for a flat tire. It's 9 o'clock at night. It's minus 11 degrees Fahrenheit, not Celsius. That's really cold, like Alaska-level cold. Like even politicians put their hands in their pockets cold. And we're there going, we're going to change a tire in the dark. The kids are in sleeping bags. They're shivering like crazy. We can hear teeth shattering in the van. I thought, maybe I can blow up the tire because I have a, a pump that I carry with me. Maybe I can pump the tire up. I get the pump out. The rubber froze. And I'm thinking, great. I'm two hours and 40 minutes from home. It's New Year's Eve. No one's going to be out. I want to get home. And then one of Oregon's finest pulled up behind me. Do you need some help? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> so the state patrolman helped Tess and I changed the car tire while the kids stayed in the car and shivered. We eventually got on our way. We found out that he had been out, was going to help someone else, and had come upon us first. And he helped us, and we drove home with the little tiny donut tire. You know what those are like. The car pulls to that side. And as we were driving home, it got so cold, I could see fog out the window. It got to minus 30. That's beyond cold. I don't even know how cold that is. I wasn't even going to try and experience how cold that was. And we finally got home, we got to bed, and we thought to ourselves, wasn't that cool how we got help? And I thought to myself, and I told my kids this, and this is the important message here, kindness always comes back. I washed, brushed off some people's cars of snow. I helped pull a guy out of traffic that was stuck with his car. I offered to help other people, not because I'm some great guy, but because it's cold and snowy outside and people need help, and I wanted to make sure they had help. And then when I needed help, someone helped me. So, boys and girls, kindness always comes back. Remember that as you go back to your seats. Thank you for sharing that, Kyle. It's a great story. Liam has a verse he wants to share, and then we're going to sing a song. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies start afresh each morning. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Thank you, Liam. I was thinking about, we had read that in our family worship this week and um, reminded me of this song, um, you know, your love, O Lord, it reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. You know, and I think about each new morning as a chance to experience that faithfulness yet again. And that's such a great promise that we have in the Bible.
you to stand as we sing our opening song.
What a wonderful song to sing as we begin or continue our worship. Now, if you join me, if you're comfortable kneeling or standing or sitting, let's seek God. Loving Father, we come to you because We've learned that that's a safe place to go. Thank you that you care about us, that you love us. Even when we don't feel very lovable, you still love us. Thank you. And today, Father, we come because we have needs. We have people who are ill or have disabilities. Please be with them. Give them comfort and strength. Be with those that don't know what to do. Give them, give them relief. There's people who are suffering other difficulties. Be with them also. Help them to know how to navigate life. Be with our children. Father, it doesn't matter how old they are. They're still our children, and we love them, and we pray for them. Be with them. Be with our young ones that they may learn to know that Jesus loves them very much. I ask that you be with the people in countries where there's war or persecution, hardship of all kinds. Keep them steady. Help them always to know that you care and that you are bringing a solution. And Father, we have so many things for which we're thankful. So many people have said 
God was good and help us with this or that. Thank you that we've been able to recognize that you care, that you really do care, and look for the good things. I ask that you be with our pastor as he brings the message today. Give him your words. Help us to hear what you want us to hear. Please fill this place with your spirit, with your angels. Guide us. Draw us close. Be with those who sorrow. Give them comfort. Thank you that you are our strength and our help at all times. And we just give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, I ask it all. Amen. morning and happy Sabbath. We have something special today in just a moment. One of the blessings that we have in this church is a lot of kids. And we always need to remember that our kids are loved by Jesus. And one of our young people, one Sabbath ago, at Camp Myvedon, publicly gave her heart to Jesus. Ellie, would you mind coming forward? Are you comfortable coming forward? You can bring your daddy with you if you want. Most of you know Pastor Luke. He's a chaplain at hospice. And this is his wonderful girl, Ellie. And I want to, can I show the video? Is that okay? Okay, all right. So go ahead and look up at the screen and bump the sound up because it's going to be a little quiet. But we want you all to share with this special occasion. making this choice to follow Jesus. And one of the symbols of baptism, as you probably said you with your dad, one of those symbols is being born again, starting a new life. And ideally, when someone's born, they should have a family, right? Is that true? Do you know that this is now your family? Yeah. But we as a church are going to make it official today. Is that cool? All right. So, is there a motion to accept Ellie into membership at this church family? Is there a second? All in favor say yes! I think it's overwhelming. We have a little gift for you, and I have one more thing coming to them to give to you later, but this is something that I pray will help you continue to grow in Jesus. All right? it's, it's a Bible, but it's a pretty cool Bible. And so that is for you to keep for the rest of your life. And now, would it be okay if I pray with you? That's right. All right. Lord God, I pray for Ellie as she continues in her walk with you. And as she, as she continues this new step in her life, fill her with your Holy Spirit. May she keep her eyes fixed on Jesus. May she fall more in love with you every day. And may you be her best friend. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for the decision she made. Amen. Something special about a life given to Jesus. You with me? 
why we're here, my friends. That's why we exist as a church. To grow the kingdom. To draw people into relationship with Jesus. That's why we exist. Today we're continuing our series on Healthy Church. We've covered a few things in this series. We've looked at how there are different principles that have been shown to be effective in helping a church be healthy. One of the principles we looked at was empowering leadership, how when the leadership of a church draws others into leadership and empowers them for ministry, the church becomes healthier. We looked at gift-based ministry when we as church members, members of the body, can minister according to the way God has gifted us, the church is healthy. We've seen passionate spirituality. Last week we looked at passionate spirituality when we are in love with God with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, and express that together. We, as a church, become healthy. And today, we're looking at the next principle of healthy church which is effective structures. Now, this may sound a little bit dry. Effective structures. But it's not as dry as you might think. And it's super important. When Juliana was a tiny baby, our little family lived in Michigan. And we... we, One spring, that spring, we took a drive from Berrien Springs where we were living and we drove about an hour north to Holland, Michigan. Anybody ever been to Holland, Michigan? Yeah. And during this time, it was beautiful. Spring had sprung, bringing forth a magnificent bloom of tulips. Field upon field of these beautiful cups flowers grace the community, and and appropriately, Holland was in the midst of their annual tulip festival. Imagine that. So they were putting on a wonderful show. Shops were open, clog makers were demonstrating their craft, hundreds of dancers and iconic wooden shoes paraded down the streets, and at the center of it all was a majestic windmill. This is the one. A majestic windmill. As we approached this structure, which had been built in 1833 in the actual Holland and shipped over to Holland, Michigan, piece by piece, as we approached, its size was amazing. We entered the, uh, the building, the, the, the windmill, with a tour guide and climbed the stairs. And, and as we did so, the tour guide described how the thing worked. And it still worked. Grinding wheat. You could buy ground flour that had been stone ground in that machine. We got up to the top, to the, the balcony area, and took pictures, and I... I've got the pictures on Facebook if you want to see them. They were so low low resolution, I didn't stick them on the screen, but they were from, you know, 15 years ago. Pictures have improved since then. It was a beautiful and wonderful experience. But this, this structure is still working. It's still an effective structure that's creating flour, though it's probably not the most efficient. More on that later. Effective structures are important. But before we get into kind of the heart of what we're talking about today, I want to give some perspective, okay? The most important structure on earth is you, the body of Christ. Let me, let's look at what First Peter said. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. He writes this to the Christians of his day and to us. As you come to him, the living stone, 
rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to Him. You are precious to Him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a temple, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. The most important structure in God's kingdom is not this shell of a building. It isn't the edifices we erect. It's not the programs we create. It's the body of believers who are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit and who represent God to the world. It's you. You as a community are the most important structure in God's kingdom. In every other structure we assemble, every other system we create, every process we develop is simply a tool for us, the temple of God, to fulfill the mission that God has given us. Did you get that? Everything else we do, everything else we have, is a tool for us as the body of Christ to do the work He has given us to do. We must keep this in perspective. Effective structures and the first effective structure is you. I want to back up a bit and look for a moment at structures in Scripture. In order to understand what we're talking about today beyond the body of Christ, I want to give a little background on what structures there were throughout history as described in Scripture. It'll give us a little context for what we're talking about. Effective structures in Scripture. What are we talking about, structures? Well, the first one would be, in my mind, the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was something that God planted, that God built for Adam and Eve to live in, right? There are scholars, however, that see more in the Garden of Eden than just a dwelling place for our first parents. It's very possible that God designed it as a tabernacle on earth. That it reflected God's throne room on earth, and later the temple and the sanctuary also were were similar to that Garden of Eden. It reflected God's dwelling place. And in fact, I see that as reasonable because God has always wanted to dwell among us, right? That has been his great goal. So the Garden of Eden, and there's lots of them here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of them. Marriage in the family is a structure that God created on this earth for the redemption of his people. It's a system that God has placed in this world for us to disciple each other and our kids. This is the proto-sacrificial system. I put proto on that because it's, it's like the, the sacrificial system that started there in Genesis chapter 4 with an, an altar and a, a burnt offering. And it, and it continued through until the time of the sanctuary in the temple where God then developed a, a larger understanding of the plan of salvation that describes just how much God loves us and His plan to save the world. Amen? Another structure. And then there's different types of structure, like Jethro's plan. We talked about this a few weeks ago, when Jethro saw how overwhelmed Moses was in the desert as they're traveling from slavery to Canaan. He saw that there needed to be some structure to help Moses deal with all the problems. And so he developed that leadership structure. Then there were the Levites and the Aaronic priesthood. This was a structure that that was purposefully put in place to represent the ministry of Christ. And Christ has and is fully fulfilling this, this structure, this ministry. And there were the schools of the prophets, whereby Elisha set up these schools where prophets could be put in place, spiritual leaders could be put in place for Israel's development and teaching. Moving on to the New Testament, Jesus, when he stepped into our reality and began his ministry, he called 12 disciples to be his followers. This was to represent the totality of Israel being committed to him and following him wherever he led. And then, of course, we have the 70 disciples that he sent out two by two, another additional structure, an effective 
structure in Scripture. We have the early church where God established His church, and among them were the apostles, those who were sent to do the work of the gospel. And then we have the deacons and deaconesses. These deacons and deaconesses were called to do the work of the gospel as well, fully empowered by God. Both apostles and deacons were were called to do the work of God. Both men and women, as well as elders in Scripture, are called to do the same thing. And then a final structure in Acts 15 we see what would be called a church council or maybe the first general conference session where they got together and discussed the business of the church. So throughout Scripture we have, and we can come up with a lot more, we have these effective structures and each one of them, the purpose of each one of them was to create more efficiency and effectiveness in doing the work of God. To reconcile humanity to God. To invite all humanity into a saving relationship with Jesus. To make and grow disciples for Christ. That is the exclusive purpose of these structures. Each of these biblical structures were put in place to achieve that goal. And so should our structures today. Notice we're using the word structures, but most of these biblical examples have little or nothing to do with physical buildings. The concept of structures is more about developing organization and creating programs than hammering nails and pouring concrete, but to be honest, buildings count too sometimes. If effective structures are the tools we use to share the gospel, then buildings, if they exist, are a part of that too. And we, as a church, have a building. And this building, my friends, is not the church. You are the church. This building is a tool for the church to use for the work of ministry. And this space is only holy as a result of what happens here, not because it is inherently holy. But this building is a tool. And Carol mentioned just a little bit ago that we've got some issues with our building that we need to address. And to be honest, if we look at our purpose wrongly, there is no reason to fix anything on this building. If we're just doing it because we want a nice building, that's not a good enough reason to have a nice building. The only reason to address a window that has some issues and painting walls and water stains and updating things in this building is so that we can more effectively share the gospel with the world that needs it. That is the only reason to do anything with this building. If we're not doing that, we might as well close down the building, and stop doing anything. Our purpose is to share the gospel with a world that needs Jesus. And this building is a tool to do that. At the end, or in October of 2023, your leadership team, the elders and the board, are planning to have a, what's called an evangelistic series. Now, it's not going to be necessarily the traditional four-week evangelistic series. It's going to be a little bit different because we need to have effective structures. Effective structures. But we're going to be having a series of meetings where we will invite the community, our friends, our family, and everybody who's looking for Jesus to come to this space where they can hear the message of the gospel. And if we do that, I'd like to have this space looking as good as possible. We want this space to be inviting. We want this building to be useful. And so that's the reason, and that's the only reason, the gospel, our mission, that's the only reason that we need to focus on doing some things for our space. Stay tuned. Join in for the business meeting on August 6th. We'll be talking about this stuff, okay? So our building is a physical structure, 
We have equipment here, obviously. We have resources. We have other things. But we also, and more importantly, we have organizational structures. We have ministry structures. And I'm just going to list a few of our ministry structures that we are growing in our effectiveness in. First, we have small groups. Luke talked about that this morning. Stay tuned. Get involved. If you want to lead one, it's, it's not hard. And Luke and I can equip you to do that. We have small groups. We have Vacation Bible Experience, Vacation Bible School, that you can be involved with to share the gospel with kids from our community. Sabbath schools and evangelism, men's and women's ministry, social committee, and that we have Milton State Line School where God's mission is shared there as well. But we have more structures as well. So many, many more, as you can see. Many, many more. We also have leadership structures here at the church that we're working on making them more and more effective. We have our church board. This is a group of people that you have given authority to oversee the working of this church. And man, they're a pleasure to work with. I love our church board. They're full of joy, and they are fixed on the mission that God has given us. Praise God. We have our elder team that has been tasked with pastoring you. Yes, I'm a pastor, but we have a whole team of pastors who come alongside me, and it's our goal to shepherd you in your relationship with Jesus. That's our purpose as elders. We have our deacons and deaconesses who take care of a lot of the details of ministry with our, yes, our building, but also with ministry as well. We have a, we're, then we're going to talk about three things that we're now developing that will be um, effective structures. We're developing a ministry placement team where we can where we can draw people into ministry more effectively. Not just nominating committee, but a continuous a continuous ministry team that can draw people into ministry. A worship committee, so we can be thoughtful about how we worship God and and be creative in our worship experience. And then a safety committee. Say, oh, isn't that boring? My friends, we live in a world that is scary, has a lot of issues. And so we thought it would be interesting and important to have a group of people who can focus on keeping our space and our people, you and our kids, safe as we minister and work together and worship together. So then we continue on. Worship structures. We also have corporate worship as we are here today. Let me pause there for a second. Worship structures. Once again, we want to have effective structures, right? Effective structures. And when it comes to corporate worship, as you've probably noticed over the past year, that we as a church family are growing. Praise God. Praise God. There's something special happening here. And a lot of it is because of you. Because you have surrendered yourself to the Holy Spirit. God is working through you. God is filling this place with joy as we gather. But sometimes we are so full in this space, it's hard to find a place to sit. Isn't that right? Praise God. But to be honest, once again, we have been given the mission to share the gospel with people who need it. And if we're going to have enough space for people to join the kingdom here at Eastgate, we've got to free up some space. That doesn't mean stay home. That does not mean that. In order to free up some space so that more people can join the kingdom of God here at Eastgate, we're, as we've told you before, we're going to be starting in an early service. It'll start at 9 o'clock, Sabbath morning. It'll be go from 9 to 10 05. Then we'll have Sabbath school, and second service will start at 11 30. The first Sabbath of this will be on August 6th. All right? August 6th will be the first Sabbath. 9 o'clock early service, 11 o'clock, 11 30, second service. And because of this, because of this, there will be room to invite your friends and family and neighbors to join the kingdom of God at Eastgate. That's the purpose. That is our goal, to fill this baptistry every Sabbath. I'm serious. If people were giving, if, if our friends and loved ones were giving their hearts to Jesus at a rate where we were filling this baptistry every Sabbath, the kingdom of heaven would be cheering every Sabbath. Would that be cool? Can we do it? No. But the Holy Spirit can through us. That was a trick question. But our job is to share the good news of the gospel and to invite people into a relationship with Jesus. 
to become disciples of Christ and to follow Him wherever the Lamb leads, right? That is our goal. That is our purpose. And because of that, we're adjusting our worship service so that we can continue to do the work that God has called us to do here at Eastgate. I'm passionate. You all right? All right. We've got Vesper's worship as a, as a worship structure. We've got a, a kind of a modified uh, Vespers coming up on the 6th before our, our business meeting. Um, social events like we have this afternoon, prayer meetings and prayer events, and we have work bees. Yeah. We've got a lot going on, you guys. We have structures, and our purpose, our goal is that each structure we have, it would be effective, that it would do the job that it was designed to do, and that, that job is to grow the kingdom of heaven. That is our purpose. The mission always stays the same, but my friends, the tools change with the times. The context change, the mission doesn't. We must hold on to our ministry structures loosely in our hands, willing to adjust to the needs of the mission. Correct? Example. I'm going out of a limb here. Hope that's okay. When a baby is in utero, some of cool stuff is going on. Have you noticed? They don't breathe air, right? Isn't that cool? There's this hose. <laughs> That's the technical term. The umbilical cord, three strand umbilical cord that goes from the, the navel all the way to the placenta, where there is then the separation between the mother and the baby, and the baby is fed and given nutrients and waste material is often taken out through that. It's like it's such an amazing process, and it is essential for that point in the baby's development, correct? But something changes when the baby is born. The blood is rerouted so that it now goes primarily through the lungs, right? It's a, it's a fundamental change in the structures of the baby's uh, circulatory system, and it's essential for that to happen. The old system was good, but the new system is now needed. And sometimes our structures need to change based on the mission. The mission, and this one is to sustain life, the mission here at our church is to sustain and grow the kingdom of God. And sometimes we need to analyze, is this structure still the one we need? Or should we adjust the structures so that they're more effective? Another example, going back to my original story. That windmill isn't very efficient. It can make a couple bags of flour here and there. But if you compare it to modern wheat grinding capabilities, it pales in comparison. It was good for its time, but it's time for something new now. And so we've now changed. I'm sure that Holland no longer uses that style of windmill to grind its wheat anymore. Sometimes things change. And even in the kingdom of God, as we, as we look at the systems that God put in place, in the Old Testament, in the, in the desert, they set up a, a tabernacle, and then they had a temple, and, and the purpose was to tell the story of salvation and explain in symbolic ways that God loved the world and He was coming to die for our sins. But to be honest, it was not complete. And there came a point where that had to be set aside because Jesus came and fulfilled it. Now, He, He is our living sacrifice. He is our high priest. He is the great mediator between, between earth and heaven. And we no longer need the old temple services anymore. That structure has been set aside. And sometimes we need to think about on a smaller scale what is effective and what can we do better. How can we fulfill the mission of God here at Eastgate, in North America, and around the world more effectively because the mission is what it's all about. 
sustaining the way things have always been is not what it's all about. Our comfort is not what it's all about. Saving souls in the kingdom is the purpose. And our structures should meet that purpose. When Christ came, He adapted to our needs. Did He change? Not fundamentally, but He was willing to change and adapt to our needs. When we ran, He chased. When we wandered, He sought. When we twisted the picture of His character, He revealed who He was in Jesus. When we were lost in darkness, heading for eternal death, Jesus laid down on the cross, carrying our sins to the grave, paying the penalty of our guilt, and giving us eternal life. He adjusted His reality to meet our needs. And we must be willing to adjust our ways to most effectively draw people to the Savior. We need to remember effective As we pray together, could the praise team come forward? Lord Jesus, I pray that you continue to work among us. May we reflect the heart of Jesus that's willing to adapt and change the way that he approached us. May we be willing to adapt and change the way we approach the world in order to fulfill the mission that you have given us. Lord, I pray that you'd continue to make us effective in reaching the lost. Build us into the into the building, the spiritual building that you would have us be, and may we be a home for those who are looking for the Lord. We love you. We're looking forward to seeing you. Amen. Please stand as we sing our closing song.
sin is righteousness alone. All the sin before We do have a cornerstone. We're very thankful for that. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you. Thank you that you've set so many things in place to help us as we grow. We can't do it without you. I ask that you bless each person as they leave the service today. Keep them close to you. Help them to know that you love them. With an infinite love, bless them. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. And before you leave, if you would like prayer, there will be people over here with the prayer banner. Uh, Wednesday evening at 6.30, we have a prayer meeting, and you're all invited. Have a happy Sabbath.